afternoon, everyone, and I'm very happy to welcome Alison McLeod in the mi middle, Maggie G closest to me, and our chair for this session, Francis Spaulding at the end, to the 25th anniversary Charleston Festival, our last day. Alison McLeod was raised in Canada, but has lived in the UK for many years. She's the author of three novels and a collection of short stories. She's also Professor of Contemporary Fiction at, Chich at Chichester University. Her most recent novel, Unexploded, was long listed for last year's Booker Prize. The story takes place very near to here in Brighton during World War II. Its central character is very affected by reading a novel by Virginia Woolf and actually attends one of Virginia Woolf's talks at a local WEA institute in Brighton. The news of Virginia Woolf's death by suicide triggers the conclusion of the novel. Maggie G is the author of 14 acclaimed books, including The Burning Book, novel, the novels The Burning Book, The White Family, shortlisted for the Orange and Impact Prizes, and a memoir, My Animal Life. She is a fellow and vice president of the Royal Society of Literature and professor of creative writing at Bath Spa University. Her new novel is called Virginia Woolf in Manhattan. It takes place in contemporary New York, and its central conceit poses the question, what if Virginia Woolf came back to life today? Frances Spaulding is an art historian and biographer and former trustee of Charleston. Her books include lives of Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant, and Roger Fry. She's the curator of the forthcoming Virginia Woolf Art, Life, and Vision exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery. So I'm delighted to welcome all our speakers and to hand over to Francis Spaulding. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, you may remember, if you were here last year, that Pat Barker introduced Toby's Room in which the character Eleanor comes down to Charleston and has a conversation with Vanessa Bell and Mrs. Wolfe. Well, as you've heard from what Diana has just said, here we are again with two further novels that reintroduce Wolfe herself as a character into the narrative. And as you just heard, first in Alison's novel, as, as she delivers a lecture, and um, more boldly, perhaps, in, in Maggie G's novel, she moves out of the bounds of the correct and possible and reinvents uh, Wolf coming back from the dead in 21st century Manhattan. Um, so this wonderfully preposterous idea of Wolf re reappearing in 21st century Manhattan, I think, is perfectly justified by Wolf's own use of Vita Sackville West in Orlando, who not only travels through time but also changes sex. Um, I just want to say that I if I may just stay a minute with Maggie's novel, that if I could just say that I found the beginning utterly believable. Anyone who has spent days in an archive <laughs> knows how uh, palpable the sense of the, the presence of the dead is so palpably present. And it no, was no surprise to me that Virginia Woolf first occur, arrives, appears in this novel in the Berg collection in New York Public Library, as well, no doubt here. Um, what is so wonderful about the Alison McLeod's novel, as, uh, McLeod, sorry, <laughs> McLeod's novel, as um, you will know, those of you who have read it, is this wonderful description of um, a period between May 1940 and June 1941, very relevant to us, an audience here today, because it was, of course, the period when Brighton was under threat of in German invasion, or so the nation thought, and there was this uh, a time of mute collective dread, as Alison describes very vividly. I think the only other thing I want to say in my introduction is what an extraordinary thing it is, this posthumous life that Virginia Woolf is having, and how vibrant and imaginative it is, and what a great fascination she seems to have on people's imaginations. If you doubt what I'm saying, go home and put a Virginia Woolf in a general search in Google and you will be astonished at what comes up. Links, books, photographs, all kinds of things. You may find that photograph of her that's well known where she's got her hand cupped in, her head face, her face cupped in one hand and a lovely fur collar spilling out on the other side. But on Google you'll find someone has added pink spotted sunglasses. <laughs> 
giving you a camp wolf. And then there's a selfie, which also amused me, where someone had gone into a, <laughs> got a photograph of Woody Virginia Woolf right beside her, so it looks as if they're both in the same photographic booth. What is it? Why does this writer, more than any other writer, inspire this desire to appropriate, to possess, to recreate? These many versionings of Woolf that are flourishing and um, uh, becoming more and more. We may touch on the reasons or reasons behind this later, but um, what I just want to say today is that, first of all, I'm going to ask Maggie to talk about her book and read from it, and then Alison will take over. Then we'll have the conversation between us and then open it out to the floor. Maggie. Yeah. Uh, th thanks, Francis. Uh, well, hello and good morning, and thanks for coming on a wet, at a wet weekend. Um, I'm excited because this is the first um, public event I've done for this book. Maggie, I've only had it... Maggie, oh. as you're not... Oh, you are ready, Mike, so that's fine, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, can everybody hear me? I should ask that first yeah, of all. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> where I got to? Yes. Um, I've only had it for about two weeks. I think it's a very lovely-looking book. Um, <laughs> and, uh, well, and one of the things I talk about there is what's happening to books... <coughs> independent books, bookshops, independent publishers, and I know my own wonderful independent publisher, are in some degree of trouble at the moment, in, in, as are so many independent publishers and independent bookstores. I think there are only 130 independent bookshops sh left in the country. So this is something <coughs> that Virginia Woolf, coming back to life in New York, would be surprised to find. Um, it's nerve-wracking doing my first event here at Charleston, of course, <laughs> in Virginia Woolf's sister's house. Um, it's wonderful to be doing it, though, to so many people to whom Virginia Woolf has been important, as she has to me um, from the age of 17, when I read Jacob's Room. Um, perhaps I should have let sleeping wolves lie, <laughs> but what I've done is tried to bring back this writer I so admire as someone alive, someone I can talk to, duet with, dance with in the present. Um, what happens? My scholar goes to New York, goes to the New York Public Library, where Wolf's manuscripts are kept in a small private part of the library. And in an echo of a room of one's own, she finds that she cannot access these manuscripts that she so wants to touch and hold because the manuscripts are so valuable. I can hear I'm going off mic. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. <coughs> okay. Um, take a drink. I don't like lecterns because you become a ball on a stick. As I'm <laughs> I'll be a ball on a stick. Um, uh, yes, she finds that she can't. She can only access the work on microphone. Um, so there is a sort of echo of the exclusion from the library that was talked about last night. Do you remember in Eileen Atkins' wonderful reading of a room of one's own and there is a sense all of us are here and we're very lucky but perhaps there is also a fear of Virginia Woolf and a sense that Virginia Woolf still belongs to a small group of educated people this isn't in the work but there is a kind of still a kind of sense of being excluded and I think readers have to overcome that to love what is really in Woolf which is a very open imagination and a democratic, enlivening imagination. Okay, um, what I've done may seem outlandish to reinvent her, to think through her, and to speak through her, but if you think of yourself as an artist, and I think I've always tried to do that, not as a claim to excellence, but as a way of thinking, um, you're linked also to visual artists, and painters have always painted back. 
If you go into the Prado, I spent three days in the Prado recently, the first thing you see, one of the first things you see is a Rubens version of Dürer. If you go into the Espresso Bar at the National Gallery, you see Auerbach's wonderful and badly displayed drawings, his versions of Titian and Poussin and Rembrandt. And I think through, through copying, through trying the same things in a different way at a different time, this is writer's way of taking hold of the heritage and keeping it alive. Um, I don't think I'm going to say any more because a lot will come up, I think, in talking to my admired colleagues here. I think Wolf would have been very pleased that two female professors and a female scholar of such note are together on the platform today. Um, and I'm going to take you to a plane, which is where a lot of novels begin. There is thunder as Angela flies to New York with Virginia Woolf in her handbag, lightning crackling off the wings of the plane, bad karma, not that she believes in it. The flight is delayed and the pilot greets them with a warning. We're expecting a little turbulence today, so if the seatbelt signs go on, we'd ask you to return to your seats and keep your seatbelts fastened. Electricity flashing on chemical-rich pools 3.5 billion years ago started life, Angela reads, the power of lightning. She snaps her book closed at once. Life on Earth, it's called. Death in the air, she's thinking. <laughs> Taxiing now, too late to leave the plane. Angela's itinerary is crazy. London, New York, Istanbul. Angela will fly direct from New York to Istanbul, nearly 11 hours. There are easier ways of doing it. Still, Angela's diary is demanding. Geography must bend to accommodate her. The curve of the earth is certainly not going to stop Angela. New York for the New York Public Library, where she will read Wolf's manuscripts in the private Berg collection, then Istanbul to give a paper at a big international Wolf conference at Istanbul University. She's not an academic, not really, she tells people, but yes, she does a few university gigs. She has an attachment. Her real work is writing novels. She's published by Headstone Press, recently subsumed into the gigantic Haslett group, who also make large profits from chopped, reconstituted meat. <laughs> now she's picked up as an alibi for takeoff Virginia Woolf's Professions for Women, written in 1931. It's a brilliant essay, but she's reading the same sentence over and over. Something about Woolf's difficulties with sex and the body. Telling the truth about my own experiences as a body, I do not think I solved. I doubt that any woman has solved it yet roaring down the runway. And as ever, part of Angela thrills to the speed as at the last moment, the bullet full of people noses up, up into the air. She's flying. And a thought out of nowhere floats across the cabin, light as a mosquito, and lands invisibly on her. If I'd met Wolf, if she had met me, what would she have thought of me? Would she have liked me? Would I like her? Charged with electricity, the thought darts onwards. Still climbing. Everyone's hoping they'll break into sunlight soon, but they don't. They continue to shudder through cloud, and the seatbelt signs remain on. Outside the window, the streaming greys are uneasy with distant flickers that may not be flickers at all, they hope, just minute changes of light or viewpoint. Then the PA crackles into action. Will everyone please remain seated with your seatbelt securely fastened? The pilot's voice sounds urgent. We're about to go through a period of turbulence. Now the plane starts to jerk like a conker on a string. There's a loud crack, some enormous force that's indifferent to them. They are tiny and nothing, and someone is sobbing. Virginia Woolf goes flying through the air and lands somewhere else entirely. Yes, it's begun. <laughs> Virginia, suddenly there's time again, and I'm in it. Plenty of time, is there? Or just a bright gap in the night of our knowing? I spent seven, eight decades in the dark, a normal lifetime, and now I am here. Am I? 
back on the blade of the here and now? Will I leave any mark when I write? Will this new world read me? I used to live long ago in a low, quiet house which had darkness at night and smelled of the garden, lilacs and roses, cut grass, cheroots, <coughs> Leonard, June nights, him safe in the house nearby, bats and owls, my brain racing sometimes but often calm, knowing I was home. One doesn't notice how sweet. Somehow, I slipped a century, stones in my pockets weighted me down, I sank, bursting, then nothing. So many years in the dark, it seems I was not forgotten. Someone longed for me here in New York. You see, I wanted Angela. I wanted to sound up to date, that was all, because my Istanbul paper was called Virginia Woolf, A Long Shadow and I decided to look at the primary sources. I'd forgotten a lot since I first read her, so I booked a last-minute package to New York. Odd thing, Virginia's the quintessential English writer, but there they all are in the New York Public Library, all those famous manuscripts, Orlando, The Waves, To the Lighthouse, in the Berg collection, the dim red leather comfort of the Berg. Virginia. She ran after me, as if I were a brigand. Once I saw it was a middle-aged woman, I let myself be caught, but it unsettled me the way she said my name, not Mrs. Wolf, Virginia. She knew my name. To be honest, Angela, in New York, my name means very little, whereas Virginia Wolf was huge here in her lifetime. New York Herald Tribune number one bestseller with the years, on the cover of Time magazine, etc., and afterwards, she did cast a long shadow, growing bigger and deeper in the 70s and 80s as all the other women were eclipsed. She's special, clearly, but all the same. Isn't it just easier to fetishise one person? Then you don't have to think about the rest. <laughs> I'm certainly not jealous. In her best work, she wrote for everyone. The clarity, the astonishing reach, the perception. The woman in charge of the private Berg collection, where the Wolf manuscripts are kept, gave me an oblong yellow reader's card. Angela Lamb is hereby admitted to the Berg collection, room 320, for research on Virginia Woolf. I like membership cards. They make me feel entitled. Virginia, of course, was born entitled. Statutory humblings. <laughs> Abandon your coat, your briefcase, your camera, your pens, your phone before you can enter. I didn't mind. I was excited. I couldn't wait to get my hands on her. Then the librarian explained. There's a rule that only applies to Wolf because she is so valuable. No original material can be accessed. I'm afraid you have to read her on microfilm. But it's hardly the same, is it? She hasn't breathed on that film or used it or touched it. Who has more right than me to read her? All the senseless no's of my life jostled and surged in my head as I sat there. Virginia, I thought, Virginia, I crossed an ocean to get close to you. Can't they let me reach you somehow? She was English, but these rich Americans had filched her. Sorry to sound you kept there. Um, <laughs> I'll take you home to Europe, I silently promised. If I can get to you, I'll slip you in my bag and take you back to Sussex, to Leonard, to Lewis. Perhaps I had spoken aloud. I'll take you back to Leonard, to Lewis. For one of the librarians was staring at me fixedly. Or no, not at me, behind me. I heard, or half heard, a croaking sound, half human, distressed, straining, and I turned in my chair and saw... Virginia, did I hear Leonard? <laughs> did I say Leonard? Can I now even remember how it was? Suddenly from nothing was I something again, my own voice waking me from too far away. I followed it up from the depths of cold, watery sleep into the warmth of a small, dim room I didn't know a woman breathing as she read, 
lips half moving, very serious, a sigh, a small <coughs> smile. She was reading me with such strong desire, and I wondered, who is she? She has blonde hair, but she is not young. I am on the threshold. I'm too tired. I don't know. A fish jerking. It's me that she's reading. Yes, it's my soul. It's me. And she reeled me up, hauled me up, a strain like a tooth being pulled. I'll stop there. <laughs> Fantastic, Maggie. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. It, it is an absolute treat to be here at Charleston and reading from this novel. It is, uh, is, the, is everyone able to hear me okay? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, as Diana very kindly said in her opening comments, uh, this novel uh, it begins in May 1940, and... Uh, is really framed around that, that one very singular year along the coast here, from May 1940 to June 41. Uh, and it was a year of simply waiting, of waiting in a, in a sort of great clenched way for a physical landing by the Germans on the beach. And although, um, if I'm honest, I, I, never, I never dreamt I would, I would be writing a World War II novel. It never really occurred to me. Until I until I started, um, and it's funny, you know some people might, might have always you know longed to write that period, and that's that's not really the case in my case. I, there are a few things that triggered the novel. One of which, perhaps the most significant one, was of uh, walking through London um, the morning after the London bombings on July eighth, two thousand and five, and feeling that absolute atmosphere of, of fear and, and dread and waiting, not knowing, of course, how long everything was going to go on. And I, I um, had an interview in London that day, and the palpable atmosphere, as we all know, of, of dread and fear really stayed with me, because, of course, on that day, we had no, we had no sense of how long that state of chaos might go on. Um, and around the same time, I, as I often do, was walking along the seafront in Brighton, and for some reason, um, I, I, I just began thinking how absolutely surreal to think of, uh, of an enemy nation landing on the Brighton Pleasure Beach and walking up the beach and taking the town. So it was really try by trying to think about us today and how we live with fear and also to try to anatomize fear and, and to sort of look at, I guess, how it relates to our worst aspects like prejudice, like racism, thinking about UKIP, thinking about Romanians and Bulgarians and, and who do we scapegoat at, at times of national fear? How, how do those two things relate? So I'm just going to take you back, just read the first page and a half initially to say a little bit um, or to show you a little bit about where the, where the novel springs from. The talk that May afternoon was of the rockfall at the undercliff. A fisherman's dory had been buried along with his dog, and the collapse had taken part of the seawall with it. The news, though negligible compared with the reports from across the channel, was repeated and wondered at in the town, as if the nerves of the population ran like thin fuses through the cliff-lined strata of chalk and flint. She stepped from the dim cave of the shop into a dazzle of sea light and, turning left rather than right, walked briskly north up Ship Street, away from the prom, where onlookers still gathered in the hope of seeing another boat safely return. Because, of course, this is the evacuation from Dunkirk. 
The music from the empty rides on the pier receded. She shifted the weight of purchases in her arms. At no point did she turn back to take in the spectacle on the beach, for she didn't want to see what the man in the shop had described, the ghostly flotilla of little boats, some popped by gunfire, listing oddly around the old carousel. She crossed North Street and hurried through the grounds of the pavilion, past its dream of domes and minarets. There was no time to stop in the gardens or to take tea at one of the sunlit tables. She had to be home before Philip. It's what everyone said these days. Routine was the thing. At the level, the town's public common, she lowered her basket and let herself rest for a few minutes in the meagre shade of an elm. On the green ahead, a group of old men played a ruminative game of bowls, but the schools had not yet emptied, and even the benches around the boating pond were empty, except for a young mother and her runaway toddler. Locally, the level was known as such for the simple reason that little else in Brighton was level. Most of the town swooped recklessly skyward as if it were a dizzying ride that had been plucked from a pier and dropped carelessly onto the coast. On three sides of the town centre, hills climbed north towards the wheat fields of Sussex and the hump of Ditchling's ancient beacon, west towards the rail terminus and the deep, untamed valley of Devil's Dyke, and east towards Race Hill, the race course, and the town's perennial gypsy encampments. For all its effort at gentility down the centuries, Brighton had never managed managed to escape the wild excesses of its highs and lows. Like the level, Park Crescent and its gated acres of garden lay in the flat bowl of the town. But that hot, simmering spring, the bowl was less a bowl than a crucible in which the events of the year to come, their vagaries and intensities, would catalyze into the hard, unyielding metal of the inevitable. So I'll pause there. That's the sort of the, the backdrop, the big picture. Uh, um, and really, it's me trying to find a sense of, of where are the pressure points in this story. Um, and to begin to sort of uh, take the reader into this, this singular year, I suppose, of fear. And going to, back to Wolf, it was really a line from her diaries um, that gave me a sense that, yes, this is how people, th these were the thoughts, this is how surreal it was. She writes in 1938, so prior to my, prior to my opening, nobody in their senses can believe it, yet nobody must tell the truth. So one forgets. Meanwhile, the aeroplanes are on the prowl, crossing the downs. So there's this sense of, of, of a pressure building and building, and nobody must tell the truth, so one forgets. The sense of the absolutely absurd, the chaotic, the destructive coming into life. And my character, Evelyn, my main character, you've just watched walking from, shop, from shops back, back uh, towards the level in Brighton. Um, she finds it very difficult to fall in with the sort of good war effort as she should. She finds it hard not to be afraid. She finds it hard not to find it all hugely surreal and impossible. And it was reading those words of Wolf that gave me a sense that, yes, that's, that's, that's a sort of legitimate feeling that one might have had. I spent lots of time in, in archives looking at letters, reading diaries, and in many of the letters and diaries of people living along the, this bit of the coast at the time, there's a sense of, of um, suppressed fear. And in fact, the BBC at this time had regular uh, little bulletins to help people deal with what they call breathing difficulties. But everyone knew, uh, they call it breathing difficulties because of the unseasonable heat of that summer. It was incredibly hot. Uh, but most people knew it was, it was really counselling on how to deal with feelings of panic 
at the time. But Woolf is, in her diaries, is just brilliant at anatomizing this sort of build up of that year. And just another little tiny bit uh, apple blossoms snowing in the garden, a bowl lost in the pond, Churchill exhorting all men to stand together. Today, Duncan saw an air battle over Charleston, a silver pencil and a puff of smoke. Percy has seen the wounded arriving in their boots. But though Leonard says he has petrol in the garage, should Hitler win, on we go. So, you know, incredible, incredible um, pivotal moments in lives along this coast for that year. And for me, Wolf's diaries gave me this stunning sense of, of, of the, the, the need to go on and also the fear that was holding back. And of course, fear has its dark side. There's, you know, it's perhaps not hatred that is our you know, most destructive emotion, but fear. And the way fear turns to um, uglier things, which is something I've, alongside beautiful things I wanted to examine in this novel. I'm just going to read you a little bit from my character, Evelyn, who you've just seen coming out of the shop. Her, her absolutely defining moment um, is, is going to a wolf lecture. She's long been a reader, and for her, reading is a small act of resistance, if you like, against, against the propaganda that's coming through her door, the government information leaflets, the notion that everyone must suddenly be sensible. Um, and... Reading is not just an outlet for her, but another way of thinking, particularly when she discovers Virginia Woolf. So Woolf did give a lecture uh, to the, w, the Workers' Education Association in Brighton in May 1940, something which is largely forgotten, and I was just thrilled to discover. So the lecture became the essay, The Leaning Tower. Um, and it takes place, in my, in my story, it takes place at the Technical College in Brighton. Um, and you should just know, before I read this little passage, that she, uh, at the lecture, as she's walking in, she actually meets her butcher, uh, Mr. Hatchet, which takes her aback a little bit. Okay, um, so here we go. So this is Evelyn um, at this sort of pivotal moment for her. In the hush of the lecture theatre, Mrs. Wolfe looped her spectacles over her ears and began to arrange her papers, as if unaware of the audience that waited patiently, deferentially even. All the while, they used the opportunity to observe unobserved this woman, who already seemed to them less a literary spectacle than someone they had collectively dreamed. Her silver hair matched elegantly, if accidentally, the silver corduroy of her jacket. The plaid bow at her neck was at once spinsterish and lavish. Her eyes had the oversized, sunken but animated quality of the consumptive, while the fingers of her left hand, Evelyn noted from her vantage point in the front row, were without exception ink-stained. Even her lips were faintly marked with blue, as if she'd been pressing her fingers to her mouth, deep in thought as she scribbled on the train from Lewis to Brighton. Her voice, as it first emerged, was unexpectedly deep. My title today is The Leaning Tower. I must confess that it is at present but a miscellany. Sorry, I keep expecting with the spirit of Walter to say, no, that's not how I speak. Uh, but I'll carry on anyway. <laughs> I must confess that it is at present but a miscellany of half-formed thoughts on the modern novel. Perhaps with your help I shall develop it into something more sensible. Evelyn unfastened her clutch and reached for a pen and paper. Mrs. Wolfe seemed as modest, as unassuming as she was grand, and her words had their own rolling music. In 1815, England was at war, as England is now, and it is natural to ask, how did their war, the Napoleonic War, affect the writers of the day? The answer, if you'll allow it, is a strange one. The Napoleonic Wars did not affect the great majority of those writers at all. Their vision of human life was not disturbed or changed by war, nor were they themselves. It is easy to see why this was so. Wars were then remote, 
wars were carried on by soldiers and sailors, not by private people. Compare that with our state today. Today we hear gunfire in the channel. We turn on the wireless. We hear an airman telling us how this very afternoon he shot down a raider. He, his machine caught fire. Sir Walter Scott never saw sailors drowning at Trafalgar. Jane Austen never heard the cannon roar at Waterloo. Neither of them heard Napoleon's voice as we hear Hitler's voice as we sit at home of an evening. And Evelyn was again in her own shuttered sitting room in her own chair and as Geoffrey tuned the wireless, wasn't it the same in every home? The news was as irresistible as it was dreaded. The lecture carries on, and it comes up to a point in the lecture where this line comes up that does appear in the essay, and it's Wolf saying, she's talking about writers and honesty and not giving out pleasing truths. And she's speaking about writers, but she's speaking about us all, really. And it comes to this line, if you do not tell the truth about yourself, you cannot tell it about other people. And rather than shrink under the older woman's attention, because Wolf has started to look at her, or she thinks she has, Evelyn stopped scribbling, met her eyes, and straightened in her seat, grateful that she had been noticed at all, grateful that Mrs. Wolf seemed to confer upon her those simple, revelatory words. She was afraid. That was the truth. She would have written it down like an SOS if she could have and held it up for Mrs. Wolfe alone to see. The bleak absurdity of each day was stripping her back. It was making her small, mean and narrow. Who was Geoffrey? Only now did she understand the terrible gravity of marriage vows and the potential of a marriage to spoil a life. After 12 years, he had finally outgrown his old need of her. The war seemed to have inspired in him a certain recklessness, a new and unexpected talent for the unpredictable, a dark sort of autonomy. He had cast off the dependence they had both mistaken for his love, and he'd abandoned her to the rituals of their marriage. She found it difficult to fall into line, to be what Geoffrey turned sensible, that, sorry, which was the opposite of what the French meant by sensible. That, that allowance for feeling, for, what, for, what, for sensitivity, was entirely lost these days, vanished. And a failure to numb one's feelings in wartime was as much an indulgence as overpriced black market rouge. I'll pause there and, uh, and we'll chat more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you both of you very much for that. Um, I just want to pick up on say that the, the marital relationship between Geoffrey and Evelyn um, weaves its way through the book, beginning with a wonderful sort of calm, almost... Um, innate uh, yes. calmness. There's a wonderful description of them walking around Regency Square most evenings after their son has gone to sleep and hardly needing to say anything to each other because they just, the pressure of the one's arm on the other is, is enough. And then as, the, book, as the, uh, the story goes on, they are infected by this fear that you talked about. And the, uh, the book that operates always at this sort of very human level, not at the sort of national news level, um, Yes. gets into their lives, doesn't it? Yes. I was reminded of uh, Auden's phrase, the expanding fear, the savaging disaster. And you have that wonderful line where, where I think it's Geoffrey who suddenly says, we're all afraid of each other, the thoughts. Afraid of what? Of criticism, of laughter, of people who think differently. And that kind of seems to have been partly s stimulated by the wartime it, it, period. It, it, it does, and in fact, that little bit uh, is actually, uh, it's, it's actually Evelyn's memory. We all seem to be afraid of each other, of what? Mm. Of, of people who think differently. That's actually um, Evelyn remember, remembering Wolf from the years. It's a little line from the years that she's oh, been right, reading. Yes, yes, yes. But that notion, and Maggie and I were speaking, speaking of this earlier, um, that notion, I, w I very much wanted to take 
big public event to take public catastrophe, but to look at it through the filter of the internet, mm. Mm. to look at it through the, the, the marriage of one seemingly, apparently, is ordinary couple, um, and they both become quite extraordinary in their own ways as the novel goes on, I think, mm. but to really look at it through the filter of, of the domestic, the intimate, more than anything, yes. the intimate. Yes. Well, I think that's what, one of the enormous fascinations of this very original novel. But Maggie, whereas we heard from um, Alison about how it was that experience of, of London on the day of the bombing and the atmosphere it created that triggered this desire to explore this notion of fear. I know you've had a very, very long involvement with Virginia Woolf and the, the huge amount of knowledge in your book, it's the same way as there is in Alison's. But was there a moment when you suddenly said, what if? Uh, yes, the moment, yes, my, I mean, my... Okay, so I, like lots of you, I first read Virginia Woolf as a late teenager probably not understanding, but loving it. Um, then I did a PhD on um, Wolf and Nabokov and Beckett, three fantastic writers. Far, mad to do three writers, of course. <laughs> you know, a small amount of one writer is what you should do. So I loved her. Um, oh, s sorry. Yeah, can you move your chair a bit closer? Move, move in a bit? Yes. Uh, up, up. Just closer to the mic. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, PhD with three. Oh minutes. yeah, um, but it's the idea of the actual novel that I'm interested in. Yes, the, so, uh, y yes, but you said long involvement. That's yes, true. true yeah. um, and and also, there were periods in my life when I didn't like Wolf. Mm -hmm. I think when I was becoming very political, and I was reading the wrong books, <laughs> so I didn't realise that um, she's actually a very good political writer in Three Guineas. She's a terrific political mm -hmm. writer. A Room of One's Own. What could be a, a greater and more sympathetic and more democratic text than A Room of One's Own. And she had that um, wonderful phrase in her, no in her diaries, my thinking is my writing, in the 1930s, didn't she? Yes, she did. But of course, her yes, writing, yes. I mean, her writing was amazing. But the actual trigger for this was literally going into the Berg collection of the York Public Library and not being allowed to get to the books. Ah, yes. mm. And so the fruitful thing, you know, being forbidden to do things is very good news for writers. <laughs> we like to be forbidden. Um, and I do say, in the, you know, the title of this event is Odes to Virginia Woolf, but I don't see my book as an ode. I see it as a, a tribute and an interaction in a way, but it's also, as I say, an act mm, of cheek. Yes. Mm. It's an act of cheek because it's no good being, it's no good worshipping. That doesn't create good no. art. Now, the other thing I want to ask um, is that both these books are stuffed full of um, a, a depth of knowledge that makes them so intriguing and um, stimulating. But what I want to know is, one of the things that you remarked just before we came on here th this morning was that you'd like to do your research, Maggie, well in advance and then leave it behind you and, and have your own version of Virginia Woolf to play with as you write the novel. Is that right? That's totally, totally true. Research wrecks books if you're always going back to it and you can mm. see it in large bundles sitting mm. on the page. So what was important to me was, I mean, I've read and reread her for years, but I had to completely, my study is lined with wolf books, but I had to just, actually I had to leave my study a lot of the time to write this book because she had to be my, my wolf. Uh, I should but say it's, a, it's a comedy, my book. It is a comedy. It is a comedy, but you yeah. also had great freedom because, of course, we can't check what Virginia Woolf said in the 21st century <laughs> against the <laughs> published record, so you had a wonderful freedom there. Did you, did you mm. find that a dangerous experience, or were you aware of, sort of checks and balances within it that you had This to... is what I think. I regret that I, even, that I had to do her real life at all because I... I think there's always problems to that, mm. which I think Alison deals with very well by keeping a distance from her. But I felt if she came back to life, she would have to come to terms with the fact of her suicide. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what she'd have to remember, and she would have to think about what happened to those she loved after her death. Therefore, I saw no way around actually imaginatively inventing the experience of her suicide. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there are no dangers, I think, to inventing her in the 21st century. That's just tremendous fun. It's, it's life for me and life for her. Mm. You know, that's obviously a conceit. It's obviously a, mm. an invention. It's and not the real Virginia Woolf, is it? It's, you know, I must mine. say, Maggie, in yours, I loved, I loved being able to see through Woolf's eyes into the 21st yes. century. That, that for me, yes. was absolutely yes. delicious. Yes. You know, to, be, um, to get 
a sort of Wolfian perception on bits of New York or, or you know, phone Lap- system, laptops. laptops. Oh, yeah, she um, prizes open the laptop with a fruit knife. Yes, <laughs> it's just wonderful. And, all, and, and, just, and even, you know, just the, the light and the wind and the, you know, the detail of, of, yeah. of Central Park and the trees, but to get oh, wolf's eyes. So but also, it gift, seems to do slightly sense. more than that. I mean, you seem to be actually challenging the values and ethos of the present day through looking at it through wolf's eyes. Mm. And she says at one point that freedom had come, to some at least. Freedoms are never thing thought possible. It was ugly, it was beautiful. Freedom for the masses is not aesthetic. Slightly snobbish. <laughs> uh, well, it's true, but she does say, of course, you know, some, I've, I've seen absurd and heard absurd criticisms of wolf for what she said about servants, but she was aware of servants. She wrote about servants. She tried to understand their lives, and she wished she didn't need servants. And and there's a passage in this book where she's talking about, yes, there are still maids in the hotel. They're they're a different color, but they're still doing the same work. Mm -hmm. But at least they can play music. There's hope that their children could have education and be something different. There's hope that they could travel, and those freedoms I mean, the book ends with the Statue of Liberty. I think Alison's book is a great deal about freedom, too. And there's a wonderful way in which, through character, through a novel that at first you see as as realistic, but you see that she's actually working with themes all the way through of prejudice and of narrowness of mind. and and, And it's quite... I think it's brilliantly done, thank you, actually. Thank you. Um, and, and, it, it, and I'm not. I mean, I've admired Maggie's work for years because she's such a daring writer. She's, you know, she she really looks at what the form of the novel is, as Wolf did, as and Wolf she did. tussles with it. And I myself have never written what I think of as a sort of straight realist novel. And for me, that was. Uh, on the surface of things, a, a bit of a challenge this time round. But ultimately, what took me into the novel was. The absolute, I, I am drawn to the surreal, I think, in all my work. And in this case, it was the surrealism of prejudice. When you think about the arbitrary, random, absolutely random nature of it, it it's still, um, I mean, I still think we're absorbing lessons about the Holocaust. We still don't quite know how to think about these things. And the absolute oddity and weirdness of, of you know, today it's Romanians, 40 years ago it was the Irish, it was West Indians, and so on. Um, it strikes me as just entirely and infinitely surreal. But on the lighter side of things, the other detail that allows me to sort of bend or to think, you know, for me, it's a realist novel, but I'm always saying in my own mind as, a write, as the writer of it, I think, isn't this odd? Isn't this curious? Isn't this surreal? Well, one, one curious fact, which I had to question in yeah. that thing was, did Hitler really... Uh, intend the Royal Pavilion to be his headquarters in England immediately after invasion. And apparently, well, the the, <laughs> the, 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 the rumor of it. Uh, the, yeah, yes, to explain, there are two boys. Evelyn has a son called Philip. He has a friend called Orson. They're um, eight and ten. And the two boys become fascinated with this rumor, which was um, a rumor of the time um, that law, uh, it was apparently broadcast on Radio Bremen. It was English. Uh, it was propaganda for English listeners, and it was Lord Haw Haw, um, uh, the name of I'm sure many many know of. Um, and Lord Haw Haw, William Joyce, uh, said that Hitler had decided that upon uh, upon invasion of England, upon taking the country, he would make the pavilion his headquarters. And I thought, gosh, how fabulous! It means through the boys' imaginations, I, I can put Hitler in the pavilion. They can they can begin this elaborate game of fantasy about Hitler in the pavilion. At one point, I got to dress him in. Um, sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of le- uh, linen suit, weekend braces, slippers, and a blue turban, sort of to, to befit the pavilion. And I love doing that. <laughs> yeah, that but I mean, the, the darker side of this is, of course, that Virginia and Leonard Wolf were listed in the mm. when the blacklist. Yes. So, uh, had there been an invasion, they would have been some of the first people to be arrested. Absolutely. Well, that's what, another of the themes in both these books is the question of suicide as a contingency as a that's very important in mm-hmm. Alison's book mm-hmm. in my book I really try and take on the whole issue of fetishizing women writers who destroy themselves mm-hmm. um, 
and I mean Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton, and, I, and there's a kind of, there's a, an, a, yeah, there's a, there's a teenager in my book, a stroppy teenager called Gerda. So there's kind of three generations going in this book. And Gerda is very unimpressed by her English teacher saying, um, her introduction of Sylvia Plath, she was a great writer who took her own life. And she said it in a particular tone of voice, a particularly sort of meaningful, respectful tone mm -hmm. of voice. And Gerda thinks, but it would have been much better if she hadn't, and she could have written more poems. Yeah. Um, so that's, yes. a, that's a kind it's of a theme. Question. It's a real question, which yes. I both take seriously, but also I try you and deal with it. through comedy. Yeah. Through, and in fact, Wolf and Angela rewrite the Dorothy Parker poem together. So they have fun with that. Another mm. version of Resume, which you probably don't know if you know that poem. Can I, can I just pick up on that a little bit as a digression? Because it, it is irritating, this fetishization of uh, women writers' illness or suicide mm. or some peccadillo that is suddenly blown up to be the absolutely dominant lens that's thrown over their work. Whereas male authors can behave incredibly badly, you know, yeah. Tolstoy and others, and, mm. and they get away with an awful lot. And nobody sort of, like Dickens, for instance, his treatment of his wife, nobody immediately says, oh, Dickens and his awful wife uh, yes. treatment. It, it, it's they somehow can get away with a lot. So mm. there's something about the female writer, that the women writer, that seems to invite this uh, fetishization. Well, it's, it's funny. I, I, hadn't, I, I have thought about the risks of... of in, in, in my novel, um, the, the, the suicide comes as, as news that Evelyn receives by phone. Uh, and I was very moved to, to learn by a friend, a friend uh, whose aunt lived in Brighton at the time, said she'd gone back. There was supposed to be another lecture. I don't, it was either for the Women's Institute or the WEA in uh, end of March, 19, or, no, sorry, early April 1941. And... Uh, and she said the, the lecture was just cancelled at the last minute. Again, this has a role in the novel. Uh, Wolf never appeared. And of course, you know, it wasn't too long, a few weeks before everyone understood why Wolf hadn't appeared. Um, that was the suicide. So it, 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 for me, it was really quite a thing to think, you know, how do I use this? How, you know, it, uh, it was a risk. And, and it's the funny thing, I think I was in Jai. Poor. Uh, sorry, I'm not often in Jaipur, but, um, but I, I was in January doing an event for the festival there, and I happened to get into a taxi uh, after events, and I, there was a, a woman who said, oh, do you mind if I share a taxi with you? I, and I, it was dark, I didn't know who she was, she was an older, very glamorous woman, I, and only after a few minutes in the taxi, I said, oh, I'm so sorry, turned to her, I said, I haven't introduced myself, we're there sharing the same seat, and it was Gloria Steinem. <laughs> and, uh, and she very kindly to deflect the attention from herself said oh what's your book about and Wolf came up and she said she was at Smith College uh, at contemporary of Plath's actually um, and she said when I was at university in the 50s Wolf was simply dismissed as an hysteric uh, she said you know the, so now the distance that's, that we've come I think is quite yes. incredible yeah. but still there's that, that side of is she, or does she get reduced to the drama of her suicide? Yeah. Well, we have come a, a long way with Wolf in studies of her. She's been investigated from almost every possible point of view. And I love the way that, Maggie, in your novel, you're heading for a conference titled uh, Cross-Cultural and Transformational Approaches. Yeah, <laughs> no, <yes. laughs> That's true. <laughs> a nice touch, that. Yeah. I've always had fun with um, academic language. I think, um, which is some, sometimes a bar to understanding rather than an invitation to understanding. But of course, transformational approaches are very relevant to Orlando, aren't they? Absolutely. You know, where she transforms herself. And it was very important to me that in this, this second life didn't end like the first. Um, so Orlando was my model in thinking mm -hmm. what, what to do with her afterwards. Actually, um, there is a, you are wonderfully self-reflexive to it, because you, at one point when she's, Angela is discussing with Wolf, um, I can't remember what it was, but Angela says, self is considered to be old hat, rather a dull Anglo-Saxon idea. And in oh, that yes. instance, you're actually <laughs> mocking all the sort of... Yes, theory. Wolf is very funny at the, at the expense of some of her scholars, I have to say. Um, I think both of us also, another thing we have in common is we both... I read that little bit about Virginia Woolf saying 
one thing that women still couldn't write about then was the body, mm. that a silence came upon them. That was hard. And I think that's something that has been left for 21st century writers to do, really, to try and find ways of writing about the sexual life honestly mm. and mm. playfully and without embarrassment. I think she actually talked about the way, the way men might look at one if one did that. Um, and well, it's interesting. I think they might mm. they can look at us, but a cat can look at a king, and we can look straight back at them, can't we? <laughs> um, and I do. That's one of the things I do make her write. I do allow my invented wolf to do, yes. to have sex and to write about sex. And in Alison's book, um, I think there's also very frank and very, very tender but careful looking at what sex was like in that time mm. with those restraints, those restraints of contraception and all those things. Yes. At this point, um, now, um, I, I thought you'd given the game away a bit about your plot, but anyway. No, <laughs> um, I said nothing. Uh, nothing. <laughs> Tantalising. Um, I'm going to open it out to the floor, and if anybody does have a question they'd like to ask, could you please wave your arm in the air, and I'll send a roving mic to you. That was a question for Maggie. Um, you were saying about research and how you left it all behind when you sort of got to writing the novel. Did you do the same when you were... I mean, I just think it's incredibly sort of brave that you tried to inhabit Virginia Woolf's thoughts and uh, her mind. In a way. Did you not try and do that? I mean, did you just... Because you're so immersed in, in your research and you know so much about her already, did you just think, I'm going to sort of let see what comes out as opposed to trying to be her, if that, if that makes think, sense. I think I let her write herself in the way that characters always write themselves. If you're immersed in them and you believe in them, and then something happens, and they, you know, I know... So they sort of write Novelist after novelist has said that. But then I tried, to, of course, to check actual references to her real life or, you know, say to Vanessa... Because one of the things she does is... She sells, she fortunately comes back to life with two first editions in her pocket. And that enables her to live in New York by selling them to an antique book, having, having signed them herself. <laughs> I love that um, bit. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I didn't want anything to be actually wrong, but I had to let her be alive. And if I'd sort of been building it always on her language, that wouldn't have worked, really, I think. Yes, so that's, that's what I meant. You weren't trying to be sort of, I must get this right... Um, would she have said that? Would she have sounded like that? Did you just sort of allow your intuition to sort of let her come through of I, its own I, accord? Yeah, almost? I suppose so. I mean, this is the folly of it, isn't it? This is the... This is the uh, I tried not to use words that she would not have known, mm. you know, so I tried to do that. But then I had to have fun. And I thought she would love 21st century language. Mm. And she would, you know, she'd grasp at that because she did talk about the democracy of words. You know, how um, educated words and uneducated words, they all dance together. She talks about that. So I think she would have been willing. She would have been... She was so curious, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. That was so wonderful about her, I think. And I think she would have... See, I, I've never seen her as depressing. I see her as tremendous fun, huge fun. Don't, yeah, don't you, Alison? Absolutely. Just sparkling. And oh, gosh, and that for me, that comes through the diaries all the time, which we both mm. love, the diaries, yes. but that absolute sparkling wit and curiosity uh, and that precise eye. You know, it's the combination of the two, this, this absolutely sort of unflinching, precise eye. But with, I suppose it's just the comedy of compassion, really, you know, the, um, and, 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 and not taking things, I don't know, an ability just to be irreverent, that great irreverence and wolf. Maggie, did you, yeah. ever, did you ever worry about the fact that you very obviously contributing to the mythology of Virginia Woolf? And that this is a vastly ballooning area. We've had Nicole Kidman portraying mm, Virginia yes. Woolf in a way that was very good in some ways, but perhaps you know, limiting in others. And were you at all worried at, at any point when you made her say something that it might enter that mythology and colour the way the public thinks about her? I think her that public is very much larger than mine, so I don't think I have to worry about that. Um, no, you see, if you're doing a 21st century wolf, it's really demythifying, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's being quite iconoclastic. So I, I think it's just, it's part of my work now, isn't it? 
Right. You know, yes. that's what I think. I am afraid, of course, I'm terrified of being reviewed by a wolf expert <laughs> who <laughs> rips me apart, but there we go. <laughs> I think what chimes so nicely at this festival is the fact that the final chapter in Virginia Woolf in Ma Manhattan celebrates the, A Room of One's Own, which, as Maggie has already mentioned, some of us here will have heard last night, read by Eileen Atkins. So it's rather nice that it's also a triumphal note at the end of that novel mm -hmm. and comes across, again, very vividly, using her own words, I think, to convey the essence, or not the essence, but some of the things that really matter about Woolf's thought and how it's carried on uh, into the present day. You see, she's a very disturbing presence at her own conference, as you can imagine. No one expected her to be there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, that's a wonderful irony, isn't it? Yeah. Delicious, yeah. <laughs> Are there any questions? Uh, this one over here, if we could get the microphone, please. Any this other side? Good. Two more, yes? Hello, you touched briefly on um, some of the ethical dilemmas that you faced during the writing and what I really liked about your book, um, Alison, was the, that you didn't shirk from the ethical dilemmas that the characters faced. Thank you. And I just wondered if you could both say a bit more about, as writers, how you deal with your own professional ethical dilemmas when it comes to um, fantasising about what a, a real person might be like now or, um, you know, confronting issues about the war. Yeah, uh, I mean, in my case, I think the, the 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 greatest questions came perhaps less around Wolf, and that's only because, unlike Maggie, I was in a, a maybe a less interesting position in that I I didn't have to go into Wolf's mind and begin thinking her thoughts. Um, so I have huge admiration for Maggie because that is a wonderfully daring thing to do. But it, that wasn't a, a particular concern. It didn't need to happen in this novel. Um, so Evelyn's always observing her from the outside. For me, the real ethical questions came around dealing particularly with the story of my third... So there's Evelyn, there's Geoffrey. It's a sort of eventually, uh, um, I, without giving too much away, a love triangle emerges with the character of Otto Gottlieb, who's a German-Jewish refugee, an artist who is fled um, Germany uh, in, just before the war begins. He was helped out. He, uh, he was an artist who'd, whose work had been confiscated in the Degenerate Art Exhibition of Munich in 1937. And I really wanted to sort of show that story because it seems to me it's large. Well, for me, it was, un, it was mostly unknown. Um, and the story of those artists who continued to paint, even though it was forbidden, some were sent to Sachsenhausen. And then, uh, you know, and there were many sort of horrible fates. Um, Otto gets out, so his fate is, um, is, is you know, it, it, it's, it's not absolutely horrible, but nevertheless I'm dealing with issues around the Holocaust and, and things he has seen at Sachsenhausen, where many, for example, many children, there are all sorts of experimentations going on even early on in the war. Um, and did I have a right to deal with that, to, to look at that? That was my big, uh, you know, I was nervous of that, to be very, very honest. Um, and I, I thought, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't grow up, I'm not Jewish. I'm, you know, I, how do I approach this? And it seemed to me the only way, I felt, I don't know, I think, I think we, we're, we all still need to think about, it's only, what, 60, 70 years ago, how do we absorb questions around the Holocaust? And there's no way I could make this book about that, and the story was otherwise but I uh, but I needed to do I needed that came into his story so I had to deal with it and the only way I felt was to kind of concentrate it into one scene there's one short sharp scene to show some of the reality of it so less was more in my case I think showing enough but not not um, letting it overspill I think it's a very good question when you're dealing with real live people and I hoped I'd get away with it by only doing her in the 21st century, but I found I couldn't. So I think the best answer is what I put in the acknowledgements, actually, which is, um, um, though most references to Wolf's real 19th and 20th century life are based at least loosely on her writings or on the biographies, her thoughts and feelings are mostly my imaginings, mm -hmm. and I locate one passage, which is a complete invention, I say no one can know what happens between two people, in other words, Lennon and Virginia. The same is true of Wolf's love for her sister Vanessa. 
and of her thought before she died. Mm -hmm. So I think that was... I'm aware of the dilemma, mm -hmm. but in the end, what Alison says about inventing, you know, as, as, as someone who isn't Jewish, inventing Jewish characters, the novel is about imagining others. Mm -hmm. That's how, we, as readers, we enter other lives. Um, we have other lives, I think, I hope. Wolf talked about our unacted parts, that through characters we're living parts that we never get a chance to in real life, and mm. that would be my humanist argument. Yeah. But there is a dilemma. There is, I, and we do. I, yeah, I so agree with that, Mag. I think as novelists, you do the research, you try to be as a, as absolutely scrupulous as you can. You then distill the research, and you leave a lot of it behind. But ultimately, I think as writers, oh, I think for literature, literature is nothing if we don't step outside or transcend our own biographies um, and take the risk of doing that. Good. Thank you very much. This is the last question uh, is from this, the is right switched on side. Um, well, ironically, I suppose, I am Jewish and my name is Gottlieb. Oh. Which is just <laughs> I thought it was a beautiful name, that's why I chose it. <laughs> um, but I just wondered, since you knew Virginia so well, how you think she might feel sitting here today <laughs> in this tent in the fear and in Sussex. And to me, it feels I was sorry it wasn't sunny this morning, but in a kind of a way, I'm pleased it's raining because I wonder if she would be smiling today and, or if she would be afraid or how or she would offended, feel... Or offended or... Or how she would feel about the fear and life in Sussex right this very moment today. How she would feel about the... the, the well, the life you mentioned, you, Kip. We, yes. We're sitting in leafy mm. Sussex and... And uh, yes, was Leonard Jewish? I'm not yes, sure. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. Where, where did the fear come from? Because I feel the fear. Mm. And yes. my grandparents were forced to leave 2,000 years ago. So, I mean, to forced to leave a hundred years ago, mm. leave here. Yes. Yes. So I'm welcome, but for how long? And I don't like to well, talk about I remainings. I wonder how she would have felt sitting here today. It's, I think it's a, you know, it's a really important I, a debate. It's something that we, we, we need to keep talking about because it's the one thing I think that slips under the radar far too easily about who we're afraid of and why. Um, so I'm not quite, I, 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 you know, I wouldn't begin to presume how she'd be. I feel slightly, you know, slightly shamefaced. I think there's one <laughs> mem member of the audience who might want to come in on this yes, question. Yes, please do. Could you wait for the microphone so we can just hear Thank what you're you. saying? Wait a minute. Microphone. Microphone's coming. I, I just think, think that our culture invokes fear through politicians, through companies, advertising, a huge number of routes. All you could be doing are taking that fear and moulding it for their own purposes. Just like to leave that. Mm. Well, I, I, I mean, yeah. the politics of fear, and that's really, uh, yes, I was, you know, that's one thing I hope to try to show. Yeah, was the I think that politics. Yes. Of, yeah. yes. In fact, um, we need to run. bring it to an end here yes. because so Leonard Wolf himself <laughs> wrote a, yeah. a I mean, pamphlet I, called Fear and Politics. I think we better end it. Um, I think also it, art and creativity is the way out of yes. these, yes, out that's of what these said. narrowings yes. of categories. Yes. It, it is about things that link us in much deeper and more playful ways. And, and they redeem us from our fears, I think, to, to some they extent. Do. I think that that's where hope lies. Stories, art, love. I make Virginia Woolf say, we were never anti-Semitic. One is allowed to detest one's in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much for being such an engaged audience and I could see this could develop into a seminar and it just shows you know how 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 you know um, how uh, stimulating the uh, f focusing on Virginia Woolf on on her work and the imaginative recreations that we've uh, heard this afternoon can be I think we have three professors three female professors on the platform this afternoon and I think that would certainly have been very satisfactory 
um, as far as Virginia Woolf was concerned. Um, and also, it, it, it perpetuated a sense of engagement, of ongoing conversation, um, as so many sessions do here in Charleston, with the people who originally either lived or frequently visited um, this space. I know some of you feel a bit frustrated, because I could see there were hands coming up there, and you'd like to ask further questions. But you can do that um, at the bookstore, um, where I'll soon be taking Maggie and uh, Alison um, to sign some books and to have a drink. Um, just one or two other things, probably the last time I'm going to say this during this particular, during this festival. Um, the, uh, as well as going to the independent books uh, shop, which uh, Maggie extolled quite rightly at the beginning of the uh, event, um, we also have uh, Carol Ann Duffy, the Poet Laureate, for those who don't yet know, wrote a poem for Charleston in celebration of our 25th anniversary. They've been beautifully reproduced in a limited hand-printed version. They're for sale on the left of the marquee uh, in aid of Charleston as you leave, and also the last opportunity to buy some festival raffle tickets in aid of Charleston. So once more, thank you to all the speakers, and if you remain seated for a moment, I will take them out. <laughs>